Let me start with the story. Okay. Uh, there's a man coming home from work, and he's tired, and it's a rainy late evening. And he walks into his neighborhood supermarket store. He goes there, and he looks for aisle five. And he's looking for that one unique breakfast cereal box that his five-year-old has agreed to eat for breakfast tomorrow. He walks down to the shelf, looks for the box, and doesn't find it there. That is his moment of truth. And the challenge facing the retailer is how do I ensure that I get the right product in the right channel, in front of the right consumer, at that right moment, right? So my name is Amit Kapoor. I've been working as a consultant for Boots and Company, AT Kani, and I've been working with retail and consumer clients for the last 10, 12 years, trying to solve some of these problems. Now what I'm going to try and talk is what are the opportunities for retailers to try and address these consumer moments using data. Okay, let me start with a confession. I am not a big data guy. I know a lot of you here are techies, a lot of you are statisticians. I'm actually a business guy, right? And a lot of problems that I have solved would be actually solvable using Excel to a large extent, the fantastic tool that we have. And the approach that you would see that I would adopt to solve is what I would call strategic problems, right? Problems that are, in, to some extent, wicked in nature. There are problems which have uh, fuzzy, fuzzy context, there is undefined data or very little data. Uh, there is there's fuzzy data, there's undefined data, there's a lot of correlations, there's a lot of causality that's built in. How do you actually take those out and build it, uh, build it into a solution? And the approach that what I would have taken in a number of these cases, and what you would find on my uh, little piece of real estate on the web, is how do you structure that problem, and I'm not talking about structuring the data, how do you structure that problem to understand what are the hypotheses that you're trying, trying to solve, right? How do you synthesize the data to try and address some of those, uh, some of those hypotheses, and then how do you solve it? And I, I mean solve it in a very abductive way, in a very hypothesis-driven way, in which both the problem and the solution kind of emerges and changes and iterates on its own. And then, how do you actually tell it into a story so that then you can go and communicate it to your stakeholders, to your business, and convince them that this is the case for change? And the argument uh, that you need to do in all these cases is how do I solve that problem to make that change happen? Right? That, that is the key thing we need to hold in mind, keep in mind. Whether we use big data, small data, that's the ultimate goal that we're trying to accomplish. Let's start with a little bit of context. Uh, I think Sridhar talked a little bit about it. For me, retail is very personal. Right? We talk about um, the moment of truth. It's the only industry where every retailer has the first moment of truth. When you actually go and use the touch the product, when you can actually pick the product up. Most other industries, it's the second moment when you actually start using the product that you're with what you kind of get into. And retail is the only one where that first moment of truth comes to. And where, whether you are walking into a dirty IOC or petrol pump, or into a public sector plant, or into a supermarket, they're all retail experiences that you have. Right? And they're all moment of truth for that customer. Retail is also inherently local. right? Uh, if you were to go and shop for a grocery down here in Banagata Road, you can go to a spa, you can go to a uh, big bazaar, you can go to a star bazaar, you can go down, maybe find a Nilgiri, food world. But that's pretty much your universe, right? And that's also the universe for the retailer. Because that's what is what is the likelihood of cashment of people that are going to come to you. I think you saw yesterday somebody talk about pin code based analysis for doing the cashment analysis. That's reality for retailers because that's their uh, data set that they're going to look at. The third thing is retail is evolving. Uh, Shida talked about $470 billion of retail, out of which roughly 5% is organized. And even though this, we've been talking a lot about internet retailing, 
internet retailing in India is 5% of that 5%, right? So bulk of the retail is actually happening when you go to a Kirana store, which is the unorganized as we would call it, even though I think they're quite organized, or the big supermarkets which you go and buy either food or not, food products. The second thing there is tremendous potential for retail, right? Because retail in India, it's 5%. If you go to another market like UK, and you look at grocery, you'll find 65% is with four big retailers, Tesco, Sainsbury, Asda, and Morrison's. And if you take the top 10, you have 85%. So the, the breadth or the potential for growth is amazing. And not only that, it's an evolving market. You can see retailers right now experimenting with formats, with customer service, with a lot of different things which they have trying to figure out how the Indian consumer works. And it's the same to outside. When you look at people experimenting with big baskets or big box retailing, now move to what you would call showrooming, as Apple would call it, or multi-channel experiences and all that. So there's a lot of trends that are evolving here. How does a retailer look at his, if we look at a profitability lens and say, how does a retailer look at uh, a customer or the revenue, the top line, right? You would go and look at, it's a simple case. You, I, a lot of, there is a footfall. There are people who walk into the store and you want to convert them into a consumer. You want to convert them into a customer, right? So there is a conversion. And then you want them to literally hold a basket. You want them to hold a basket, put stuff into it, and hopefully they put enough number of items at a high average value so that they walk out with a big basket that benefits you, right? That's the whole mechanism that you're trying to optimize, whether it's an online to some extent or definitely when it's offline. And on the cost side, if you look at it, the bulk of the cost is merchandising. Because that's what a retailer is trying to reduce. That is the 70, 60 to 70% of the cost in a retailer. Because he's a trader, he's buying the product and selling it to a large extent. The next big item is store specs. And store productivity is one of the key metrics that a retailer would look at. So gross margin per square feet, or if you were to call the equivalent of velocity like we talk about velocity in data, the equivalent of velocity in a retail is how is how fast is my product flying off the shelf and am I making money out of that? Those are the two big parameters. Just two metrics to just give a sense of how hard a business it is. If you look at gross margins for a retailer, the average for the top 250 retailers would be only 3.8%, right? So that's how thin the margins that a retailer works in. None of them are Indian. None of the new Indian retailers are in the top 250. If you're on groceries, actually even lower, 2.8. If you're actually hard wines, which is kind of DIY furnitures and all, you'll be 5.5. If you're fashion, yes, you make more money, 7.8. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so this is net margin. So gross margin. No. Gross margins would be uh, 30, 25 to 30, but net margins after you've taken out the cost for uh, store space employees and central, we'll be actually looking at that. The other thing, if you just look at Q ratios, which is just the market cap by asset uh, that, the, uh, that the retailer has, the average for the industry is 0 0.8, right? So you could actually technically buy a retailer, right? Sell up all its asset <laughs> and still make money, right? If you look at, for a fashion retailer, yes, it could be a little higher, 1.6. If you look at people who really do well, the Amazons of the world, the Apples of the world, the Inditex, the H&Ms of the world, you get to more like four and five. So they are really adding value on top of their assets and stuff. But for the rest of them, it's pretty much point eight. So not only is it a low margin business, it's a very asset intensive business. So when we talk about big data or any data, the ability for our data or any analytics to do on the data to bump up our margins is very high. It's very high. As well, the ability of this data through price comparison websites and retailers to actually bump it down is also very high because it works both ways. So what are the three what are these three two or three things that your retailer can do to actually use data in a more effective way? Right? And there are there are lots of jargon we can throw it at the end, there are three basic buckets that you can look at, right? You can either make the supply side more effective, right? So the inventory that you're holding, the cost that you have of your products, how do you make it more effective? You can either optimize the demand, right? 
or you can make the customer part more effective. Where are you coming with this loyalty part that Shridhar talked about, the merchandising, uh, the loyalty part, the resell part and all that. So he's covered that very nicely. Right? Uh, so we'll talk about the first two. right? Uh, how should we do that? Right? So let's, I mean, kind of think of this big data as something dramatically new that has come up. It's actually not really new. Data has been there for uh, a long time. Right? If you look at, uh, let's start with the story. Right? So the second story. I'm going to tell only three stories in this uh, session. The second story, right? Uh, 1948, there is a local food store in Philadelphia which comes across with Bexel Institute and says, I want a way to actually classify my products so that I can check them out fast. So two young graduate students, well, pretty much like that, you know, young developers here, worked on that problem and patented with the USPTO, patent number 2612992, you can actually search it on Google, you'll get this image. This is the patent that they filed, it's the art of classifying items through identifying patterns. Sounds very big data type, right? The art of identifying, classifying items through the use of patterns, right? And this is technically what we would call the first barcode, well it's not really barcode, so it's a concentric circle bullseye, which is how you would say it. And it took the industry another 20 years before they standardized on this, which is the UPC, the Universal Product Code, which is used now everywhere to scan products and make them check out, right? It's used in retail, it's actually used in many other industries, right? And if you look at the concerns that have, they exploded in 73, the first thing that came out was a 10 pack weekly cleaner for 67 cents. It was the first item ever scanned. And it never picked up. The, it never picked up for five years. People wrote obituaries of the scanner data. People wrote business media recover saying the scanner supermarket experiment is dead. Right? And it never picked up. And there were concerns on data integrity and privacy. Customers were not willing to buy this. A concept because they thought if we can't see the price but we see a scan code, what is preventing the retailer from changing the price behind our back? So there were senators trying to repeal this and say we don't want barcode here. Right? It sounds very similar to what a lot of the concerns we now hear about data, right? And it took the industry another five years in 1980 before this really picked up. And it really picked up once the Walmart of the world and the Kmart of the world started to use this to make the products more efficient. And then came the term of point of sales, right? So that is the genesis of point of sale. The point of sale data that picked up at that time is really that drove the scanner data, which was first with the retailers and then with the consumer companies coming through the retail links that Walmart's the world established, which then kind of plugged into the industry and then was started to use to become more efficient consumer discount, right? So that's the genesis of where we are on this efficient. And what is the next step where the big data can take us? What is this efficient consumer response that has been talked about? There have been RFID being talked about for a long time, which has never really picked up. But the future of this uh, power of big data is really coming into how can we take the similar data, which is skew by inventory level, and convert it into a demand sensing platform where we can actually sense the demand in a very short term. We can then in hope that we can actually service that demand. And not only do it at a com company level, but the problem is to solve it across what I would call a multi-enterprise level. So not only the retailer solves it, but the retailer works with its consumer company and solves it. Uh, and if they do it, you can actually optimize the inventory across the entire chain and make it much more effective. And then that's why you have this concept of demand driven supply chains, which is really around when a retailer picks up a part of sales stock from the sell can that trigger a demand so that people can actually supply the, the supply can then supply the product and I have my moment of truth where I'm not facing a stock. There are companies that are doing this well. The uh, Terra Technologies is one of them that actually does a very good demand sensing tool which is adopted by a bulk of different consumer companies. And they really use pattern identification and a lot of algorithms to kind of manage the demand sensing part and integrate it. But the challenge here is actually integrating not at, at a company level but actually doing it across your chain because until you do that, you don't see the next level of benefits that uh, you would anticipate you would want. What's the second problem that, that the retail uh, that the re retailers face? 
right? And uh, this is another funny story. It talks about uh, there are these two little fishes that are walking, swimming in the swimming, walking fishes in the water. They're swimming in the sea, and an older fish passes by, right? and then asks them, "Well, how's the water?" The two fishes swim along, and then one of them turns to the other and says, "What the hell is water?" Right? So there is this other data which is all around us, which is very observable, which is can be actually gathered by observation. And this is really how consumers, how consumers really interact with the store environment. So I think um, the Google keynote actually talked a lot about the Red Riding Hood story, which talked about how all that data is a process. And there are people who have done this. There is a uh, people who looked at how people interact in these old, uh, small spaces, the science or the art of shopping, and how people actually move in this. Taku Anderhal did this in 1977. And he actually looked at really people, observing people right now, how they are interacting in the retail environment. His background was from anthropology. And he, looking at that data, which was tons of data, he started with really people walk through noting down every aspect of how a consumer walks in, touches the retail environment, interacts with the retail environment, looks at it, data, doesn't pick it up, does pick it up. Tons of this data, which we would now call potentially like to capture the big data, and actually started to analyze. And the in-store environment, which was really what picked up, built this science of shop. And you had all these null insights that are coming through, which now are being validated again by big data. Uh, how does customer react when he walks into the store? And there is this entry zone where like where he doesn't actually interact with any environment in the store. There is the fact that we need shopping carts to actually make us effective, right? This was not discovered for a long time. The fact that we actually walk on the right when we look at a grocery store, we don't really look at um, we don't really look at uh, we don't look at the stuff that's on the left side. We are naturally walking towards the right. And how intersection actually increases your ability to buy a product. When somebody walks into a retail store and a person comes in and says, can I help you? It's actually because they figured out that actually increases the propensity of purchase. And there were many such insights that they picked up in terms of what men don't like, what pricing, what women like, what pricing, how senior shopping says. And all this was done in a way which weren't, didn't really require big data at that time. It was done through manual observations, later through video cameras being transcribed. And the future of this now, is the use of big data, is how do we get these in-store insights, how do we get these shopper insights using, analyzing the video data, analyzing the mobile data that is there in the, as we walk across, and there are companies that are doing this, Retail Next does this, it looks at all the video data that comes in, and triangulates with the mobile data that you have, and places it. There are companies that give you a reward to actually walk around the stores, place cars, trust this. To actually see that whether you can, we can gather the footfall data that will actually help us generate the heat maps that are required to actually see whether which part of the stores are the customers walking in which part of it, right? And this links into not only the in-store customer aspect of it, but also how employees react. So what should be the design of the store? How should merchandising be kept? And how what are the then the options of operation improvement that can happen, which can take over all these costs? So those are two examples around. Uh, how what we've been doing in retail for a long time can be taken to the next level by layering in this layer of big data, right? There are others, I think, which we which I won't dive into, but the next best stopper, which is, I think Sheila talked about how do you give the next best offer to the customer the moment he walks in or the moment he makes a purchase, so I know about that. How about multi-channel? Big question for a lot of retailers. You won't see any Indian retailer right now offering two channels. Most of them are either online or are they offline. How do you actually integrate these two and make that happen? And then not only this, but demand shipping. So how can we change pricing, promotion, and optimization to actually change this? And the challenge uh, for retailers at Report to actually do that. One is privacy. So there are huge concern on privacy. The moment I start observing your offline data activities, you are, most customers are okay or they don't realize that they're being tracked online. But the moment I have a video camera and I start tracking you and I kind of start using that as a case, uh, big issues. Target did this recently when they talked about how customers' behavior changed because 
at key moments in their life. And if we can predict those key moments on life, we can actually get better. And one of the moments was when first uh, when a woman gets pregnant. So when we are about to bring out a family, then that's a moment, and that raised huge privacy concerns. How, if we predict that moment, uh, we may not be comfortable being know, be comfortable being told that somebody has actually predicted that for us, even though we are not. So there's huge privacy concerns in this aspect. The second is legacy IT and, and the mindset around it. I worked with a number of retailers where we would ask for, we have the store data, can we optimize the store range to more than uh, to each store? So personalizing at a store level, not even at a consumer level. And a lot of the challenges that come across is that we built our IT system, it's already hard coded into nine categories of stores, we can't really move around that. So this whole investment that is required to layer in this legacy IT or either we remove that legacy IT or layer something on is a hard question for retailers, especially when you link it back to the fact that they don't have high margins to actually support a lot of this capital investment. And the third is obviously talent. Um, everybody's excited about working on the cutting edge uh, topics for the, for, uh, for a lot of internet startups, you'll find very few people interested in going to a retailer and say, I'm going to help you develop the next one. Um, why do you say uh, any retailers have not caught on to the uh, data analysis? What are your reasons? I, I mean, I think in the character statement that they have not really caught on to the data analysis. I, I think they have, a lot of them have uh, have good loyalty programs. So if you look at where is the big money that they wanted, uh, where there's a big money to be made or big potential for improvement, is actually more on the customer side stuff that Sheila talked about. And I think they are, they are starting to do something. They have loyalty programs. They started to mine it and started to use it. But if you think about challenges about in-store design, I've never had a good experience shopping into one of the uh, reliances or the big bazaar. And uh, or any of this retail experiment, and if you look at demand supply chain, I think just the supply chain is not that developed right now for them to start talking about this. Okay, thank you.